All right, I am back with more Into the Wild. Um, just a quick recap from the last week. Um, we read chapters 10 and 11, I believe, and a lot of it was still going into the background behind Chris's family, um, you know, how people felt about him, and just some comparisons between him and other people, maybe trying to draw reasons as to why he went on the trip that he did. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. This is chapter 12. It's called Annandale. It starts off by saying, in 1986, on the sultry spring weekend that Chris graduated from Woodson High School, Walt and Billy threw a party for him. Walt's birthday was June 10th, just a few days away, and at the party, Chris gave his father a present, a very expensive Quester telescope. I remember sitting there when he gave Dad the telescope, says Corinne. Chris had tossed back a few drinks that night and was pretty blitzed. He got real emotional. He was almost crying, fighting back the tears, telling Dad that even though they had had their differences over the years, he was grateful for all the things he had done for him. Chris said how much he respected Dad for starting something out of nothing, working his way through college, busting his ass to support eight kids, and it was a moving speech. Everybody was there, there was all choked up. And then he left on his trip. Walt and Billy didn't try to prevent Chris from going, although they persuaded him to take Walt's tax, uh, Taxico credit card for emergencies and extended a promise and uh, exacted a promise from their son to call home every three days. We had our hearts in our mouths the whole time he was gone, says Walt, but there was no way to stop him. After leaving Virginia, Chris drove down south and then across, west across the flat Texas plains through the heat of New Mexico and Arizona and arrived at the Pacific coast. Initially, he honored the agreement to phone regularly, but as summer wore on, the calls became less and less frequent. He didn't appear back home until two days before fall term was to start at Emory. He walked into the Annandale house. He had a scruffy beard and his hair was long and tangled. He had shed 30 pounds from his already lean frame. As soon as I heard he was home, says Corinne, I ran to his room and I talked to him. He was on the bed asleep and he was so thin. He looked just like those paintings of Jesus on the cross. When mom saw, saw how much weight he had lost, she was a total wreck. She started cooking like mad to try and put some meat back on his bones. Near the end of his trip, it turned out Chris had gotten lost in the Mojave Desert and uh, had nearly succumbed to dehydration. His parents were extremely alarmed when they heard this about uh, when they heard about his brush with disaster, but were unsure how to persuade Chris to exercise more caution in the future. Chris was good at almost everything he ever tried, Walt reflects, which made him supremely overconfident. If you talked him out of something, uh, if you attempted to talk him out of something, he wouldn't argue. He'd just nod politely and then do exactly whatever he wanted. So at first I didn't say anything about the safety aspect. I played tennis with Chris, talked about other things, and eventually sat down to discuss the risks he had taken. I had learned by then that a direct approach, by God, you better not try a stunt like that again, didn't work with Chris. Instead, I tried to explain that we didn't object to his travels, we just wanted him to be a little bit more careful and keep us better informed of his whereabouts. To Walt's dismay, Chris bristled all this a uh, small dollop of fatherly advice. The only effect it seemed to have was to make him less inclined to share his plans. Chris, says Billy, thought we were idiots for trying for worrying about him. During the course of his travels, Chris had acquired a machete and a 30 6 rifle. And when Walt and Billy drove him to Atlanta to enroll in college, he insisted on taking the big knife and the gun with him. When we went with Chris up to his dorm room, Walt laughs, I thought his roommate parents were going to have a stroke on the spot. The roommate was a preppy kid from Connecticut, dressed like Joe College, and Chris walks in with a scraggly beard and worn out clothes, looking like uh, Jeremiah Johnson, packing a machete and a deer hunting rifle. But you know what? Within 90 days, that preppy roommate had dropped out while Chris had made his while Chris had made the dean's list. To his parents' pleasant surprise, as the school year stretched on, Chris seemed thrilled to be at Emory. He shaved, trimmed his hair, and readopted the clean-cut look he'd had throughout high school. His grades were all nearly perfect. He started writing for the school newspaper. He even talked enthusiastically about going to get a law degree when he graduated. Hey, Chris boasted to Walt at one point, I think my grades will be good enough to get into Harvard Law. 
That summer, after his freshman year of college, Chris returned to Annandale to work for his parents' company, developing computer software. The program he wrote for us that summer was flawless, says Walt. We still use it today and have sold copies of the program to many clients. But when I asked Chris to show me how he wrote it, to explain how it worked the way it did, he refused. All you need to know is that it works, he said. You don't need to know how or why. Chris was just being Chris, but it infuriated me. He would have made a great CIA agent. I'm serious. You guys know, I know guys who work for the CIA. He told us that we needed to, he told us what we needed to know and nothing more. He was that way about everything. Many aspects of Chris's personality baffled his parents. He couldn't, he could be generous and caring to a fault, but he had a darker side as well, characterized by monomania, impatience, and unwavering self-absorption, qualities that seemed to intensify through his college years. I saw Chris at a party after his sophomore year at Emory, remembers Eric Hathaway, and it was obvious he had changed. He seemed very introverted, almost cold. When I said, hey, good to see you, Chris, his reply was cynical, like, yeah, sure. That's what everybody says. Uh, it was hard to get him to open up. His studies were the only thing he was interested in talking about. Social life at Emory revolved around fraternities and sororities, something Chris wanted no part of. I think that everybody started going Greek. I think that when everybody started going Greek, he kind of pulled back from his old friends and got more heavily into himself. The summer between his sophomore and junior years, Chris again returned to Annandale and took a job delivering pizzas for Domino's. He didn't care that it wasn't a cool thing to do, says Corinne. He made a pile of money. I remember he'd come home every night and do his accounting at the kitchen table. It didn't matter how tired he was. He'd figure out how many miles he drove, how much Domino's paid him for gas, how much gas actually costs, his net profits for the evening, how it compared to the same evening the week before. He kept track of everything and showed me how to do it, how to make, the, how to make a business work. He didn't seem interested in the money so much as the fact that he was good at making it. It was like a game, and the money was a way of keeping score. Chris's relations with his parents, which had been unusually courteous since his graduation from high school, deteriorated significantly that summer, and Walt and Billy had no idea why. According to Billy, he seemed mad at us more often, and he became more withdrawn. No, that's not the right the word. Not that's not the right word. Chris wasn't ever withdrawn, but he wouldn't tell us what he was on, what was on his mind, and he would spend more time by himself. Chris's smoldering anger, it turns out, was fueled by a discovery he made two summers earlier during his cross-country waverings, wanderings. Excuse me. When he arrived in California, he'd visited the El Segundo neighborhood, where he'd spent the first six years of his life. He called on a number of old family friends who still lived there, and from their answers to his queries, Chris pieced together the facts of his father's previous marriage and subsequent divorce facts to which he did he hadn't been privy. Walt spent a uh, split from his first wife, Marcia. It was not clean uh, or amicable. It was not a clean or amicable parting. Long after falling in love with Billy, long after she gave birth to Chris, Walt continued his relationship with Marcia in secret, dividing his time between two households and two families. Lies were told and then exposed beginning more lies to explain away the initial deceptions. Two years after Chris is born, Walt fathered another son, Quinn McCandless, with Marcia. When Walt's double life came to light, the revelations inflicted deep wounds, and all parties suffered terribly. Eventually, Walt, Billy, Chris, and Corinne moved to the East Coast. The divorce from Marcia was at long last finalized, allowing Walt and Billy to legalize their marriage. They put all their turmoil behind them at the best they could and carried on with their lives. Two decades went by, wisdom accrued, the guilt and the hurt and jealousy and jealous fury receded into the distant past. It appeared that the storm had been weathered. And then in 1986, Chris drove to El Segundo, uh, made the rounds of the old neighborhood and learned about the episode and all of its painful detail. Chris was the sort of person who brooded about things Corinne observes. If something bothered him, he wouldn't come out right away and say it. He'd keep to himself, harboring his resentment and letting the bad feelings build and build. That seems to be what happened following the discoveries he made in El Segundo. 
Children can be harsh judges when it comes to their parents disinclined to grant clemency, and this was especially true in Chris's sense. More even than most teens, he tended to see things in black and white. He measured himself and those around him by an impossibly rigorous moral code. Curiously, Chris didn't hold everyone to the exact same standards. One of the individuals he professed to admire greatly over the last two years of his life was a heavy drinker and uh, an incorrigible uh, philanderer who regularly beat up his girlfriends. Chris was well aware, well aware of the man's faults, yet he managed to forgive him. He was also able to forgive or overlook the shortcomings of his literary heroes. Jack London was a notorious drunk. Tolstoy, despite his famous advocacy of celibacy, had been an enthusiastic sexual adventurer as a young man and went on to father at least 13 children some of whom were conceived at the same time in the um, sorry some of whom were conceived at the same time the censorious count was thundering in print against the evils of sex like many people chris apparently judged artists and close friends by their work not their life yet he was temperamentally incapable of extending such leniency to his father Whenever Walt McCandless, in his stern fashion, would dispense a fatherly admonishment to Chris, Corinne, or their half-siblings, Chris would fixate on his father's own less-than-sterling behavior many years earlier and silently denounce him as a sanctimonious hypocrite. Chris kept careful score, and over time he worked himself into a collar of self-righteous indignation that was impossible to keep bottled up. After Chris unearthed the particulars of Walt's divorce, Two years had passed before the anger began to leak to the surface, but leak it eventually did. The boy could not pardon the mistakes his father had made as a young man, and he was even less willing to pardon the attempt at concealment. He later declared to Corinne and others that the deception committed by Walt and Billy made his entire, entire childhood seem like fiction. But he did not confront his parents with what he knew, then or ever. He chose instead to make a secret of his dark knowledge and express his rage obliquely in silence and sullen withdrawal. In 1988, as Chris's resentment of his parents hardened, his sense of outrage over injustice in the world at large grew. That summer, Billy remembers, Chris started complaining about the rich kids at Emory. More and more of the classes he took addressed such pressing social issues as racism and world hunger and inequities and the distribution of wealth. But despite his aversion to money and conspicuous consumption, Chris's political leanings could not be described as liberal. Indeed, he delighted in ridiculing the policies of the Democratic Party and was a vocal admirer of Ronald Reagan. At Emory, he went so far as to co-found the College Republican Club. Chris's seemingly anomalous political positions were perhaps best summed up by Thoreau's declaration in the book Civil Disobedience. I heartily accept the motto, that government is the best which governs least. Beyond what his views were not e beyond that, his views were not easily characterized. An assistant editorial page editor of the Emory Wheel, he authored uh, scores of commentaries. In reading them half a decade later, one is reminded how young McCandless was and how passionate. The opinions he expressed in print, argued with the idiosyncratic logic, were. Uh, were all over the map. He lampooned Jimmy Carter and Joe Biden because of the resignation of Attorney General Edwin Meese, lambasted Bible thumpers of the Christian right, urged violence against the, th the Soviet threat, castigated the Japanese for hunting whales, and defended Jesse Jackson as a viable presidential candidate. In a typically immoderate declaration that uh, lead sentence of McCandless's editorial of March 1st, 1988, it reads, We have now begun the third month of the year, 1988, and already it is shaping up to be one of the most politically corrupt and scandalous years in modern history. Chris Morris, the editor of the paper, remembers McCandless as intense. To his dwindling numbers of conferas, McCandless appeared to grow more intense with each passing month. As soon as class ended in spring of 1989, Chris took his Datsun on another prolonged, extemporaneous road trip. He only got two cards from, uh, we only got two cards from him the entire summer, says Walt. The first one said, headed for Guatemala. 
when I read that, I thought, oh my God, he is going down there to fight for the insurrectionists. They're going to line him up in front of a wall and shoot him. Then toward the end of the summer, the second card arrived, and all it said was, leaving Fairbanks tomorrow, see you in a couple of weeks. It turned out he changed his mind, and instead of heading south, he had driven to Alaska. The grinding, dusty hall of the Alaska Highway was Chris's first visit to the far north. It was an abbreviated trip. He spent a short time around Fairbanks, then hurried south to get back to Atlanta before the uh, start of fall classes. But he had been uh, smitten by the vastness of the land, by the ghostly hue of the glaciers, and by the pellicid subarctic sky. There was never any question that he would return. During his senior year at Emory, Chris lived off campus in his bare Spartan room furnished with milk crates and a mattress on the floor. Few of his friends ever saw him outside of classes. A professor gave him a key for after hours access to the library where he spent much of his free time. Andy Horowitz, his close high school friend and cross country teammate, bumped into Chris among the stacks early one morning just before graduation. Although Horowitz and McCandless were classmates at Emory, it had been two years since they had seen each other. They talked awkwardly for a few minutes, then McCandless disappeared into a corral. Chris seldom contacted his parents that year, and because he had no phone, he couldn't easily, they couldn't easily contact him. Wallace and Billy grew increasingly worried about their son's emotional distance. In a letter to Chris, Billy implored, you have completely dropped away from all who love you and care about you. Whatever it is, whoever you're with, do, do you think this is right? Chris saw this as meddling and referred to the letter as stupid when he talked to Corinne. What does she mean, whoever I'm with, Chris railed at, by, uh, railed at his sister. She must be nuts. And you know what I bet? I bet they think that I'm a homosexual individual. How, do they, how would they ever get that idea? What a bunch of idiots. In the spring of 1990, when Walt, Billy, and Corinne attended Chris's graduation ceremony, they thought he seemed happy. As they watched him stride across the stage and take his diploma, he was grinning from ear to ear. He indicated that he was planning another extended trip, but implied that he'd visit his family in Annandale before hitting the road. Shortly thereafter, he donated the balance of his bank account to OXFAM, which is a charity for food. He loaded up his car and vanished from their lives. From then on, he scrupulously avoided contacting either his parents or Corinne, the sister for whom he purportedly cared immensely. We were all worried when we didn't hear from him, says Corinne. And I think my parents' worry was mixed with hurt and anger, but I didn't really feel hurt by his failure to write. I knew he was happy and doing what he wanted to do. I understood that it was important for him to see how independent he could be. And I and he knew that if I if he had written or called me, mom and dad would find out where he was, fly out there, and try to bring him home. Walt does not deny this. There's no question in my mind, he says, that if we had any idea where to look, I would have gone there in a flash, gotten a lock on his whereabouts, and brought our boy home. As month, months passed without any word of Chris, and then years, the anguish mounted. Billy left the house without... Uh, never left the house without leaving a note for Chris posted on the door. Wherever we were driving out and saw a hitchhiker, she says, if he looked anything like Chris, we'd turn around and circle back. It was a terrible time. Night was the worst, especially when it was cold and stormy. You'd wonder, where is he? Is he warm? Is he hurt? Is he lonely? Is he just okay? In July 1992, two years after Chris had left Atlanta, Billy was asleep in the Chesapeake Beach home that she had, uh, when she bolt upright in the middle of the night, waking Walt. I was sure I'd heard Chris calling, calling me, she insists, tears rolling down her cheeks. I don't know how I'll ever get over it. I wasn't dreaming. I didn't imagine it. I heard his voice. He was begging. He said, mom, help me. But I couldn't do anything for him because I didn't know where he was. And that was all he said. All right, and that's the end of chapter 12. Um, basically, to quickly summarize, because uh, it was a little bit confusing, it's just his family talking about um, the behaviors that, that he had when he first left and the reason behind why he was so disconnected from them. It probably explains a lot as to why the main character in the book never wrote um, 
any of his family while he was gone and why he was so secretive um, when he was on his adventures across country. Um, so if you guys, you know, want to have these discussions, I'm always encouraging you all to post them in the comments of the video or um, you could have some of your staff email me if you have any questions that you want clarification. I think that that kind of discussion will be good. So until next time, bye.